Hello and welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to people about the how and why of creativity. I want to know more about their materials, their processes, what it is that motivates or inspires them to keep creating. I'm also interested in exploring the practicalities of being a creative person. And in this series of the podcast, I'm exploring the business of creativity, the skills and mindsets creatives use to share, promote, and sell their work. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, and in this episode, I'm talking with Jason Borbay. Jason is an artist, author, and entrepreneur. As an artist, he goes by the single name of Borbay and even has his own logo. And this exemplifies so much of his approach to being an artist. Every aspect of what he does is a considered act of branding and storytelling, which we dig into in this conversation. And Jason's also written numerous articles for Forbes that explore the business side of the art world. Other topics that we cover include Jason's extraordinary career path from graphic designer to stand-up comedian to working in the corporate world in recruitment before finally committing to becoming a full-time artist at the age of 28. We cover how the skills he learned from working with some of the top video game companies have influenced how he markets his work, his relationship with collectors, his approach to pricing and why he raises his prices every single year, managing commissions and why it's sometimes better to just say no, and some of the key strategies he has used to raise his profile as an artist. I am so excited to have Jason on the show as he exemplifies the idea of the artist as entrepreneur, and he does it in a way that integrates seamlessly with his creative practice. So much so, in fact, that being an entrepreneur almost appears to be a part of his practice. If you're looking for creative ways to share your work, if you want to shake up how you think about marketing your work, or if you're just looking for a bit of inspiration, then you will enjoy this episode. Oh, and you definitely need to check out his challenge to listeners at the end. It is fantastic. For as many people that think, you know, being business forward as a creative is crass, so many of my collectors are so stoked about my entrepreneurial nature. I mean, that's what they are. A lot of the people that I connect with, my greatest collectors become evangelists. They introduce me to a ton of people. They buy a piece almost every year, and it's they're excited about being on the journey with you. Do you have any ch- questions for me before we jump in? No, no. I feel I feel good to go. Let's rock and roll. Let's jump right in. Okay, fantastic. So, um, hello. (laughs) So the first question I generally ask guests is if you could just introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you do. Well, hello. uh, My name is Borbay, B-O-R-B-A-Y, and I am thrilled to be here. I am a full-time professional self-represented artist who has been making a career of it since 2009. Um, I live in Victor, Idaho, which is just outside of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And I'm here today to talk about art business and just enjoy a great conversation with Jeremiah. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. So I understand because I've been, I've been researching you online that you didn't start out as an artist. So could you tell us where you started your professional life and how you came to being an artist or identifying as an artist? Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. Identifying as an artist. Yes. So um, basically, I was just a story of one of those children who, from as soon as they could pick up a pencil, was just always drawing, always painting, always coloring. It was just, it was such a deep passion of mine. And uh, throughout middle school, throughout high school, I was very focused on art. I was in advanced placement art when I was in ninth grade, all the way through, um, kept sketchbooks religiously. And essentially, I had two loves at that phase of my life, which was running and art. And when it came time for college, I looked at a lot of really good art schools, but decided I wanted to run in division one. So I went to Boston University. I did two years of foundation, drawing, painting, sculpting, printmaking, photography, um, and then segued into a graphic design major. Because when I matriculated into college in 1998, they were giving signing bonuses to graphic designers. And by the time I graduated in 2002, the tech bubble had burst and I was having a hard time getting a job at Blockbuster. So I kind of went in a a weird direction with my career. I randomly got on a reality TV show, which I did for six months in East Boston, saved up the money from that experience, moved to Manhattan, and I was going to be an actor and I was going to take acting classes, but I had no money. So I decided to just do stand-up comedy, which I tried for about a year uh, with very little to no success. Um, And from there, I moved on to, through a random interview, I ended up uh, at the Trump Organization, 
where I was a legal development associate working on developing large scale projects such as Trump International Hotel and Tower Chicago, Trump International Hotel and Tower Vegas. Uh, then when the market started showing some cracks, I went into uh, the licensing department and worked with uh, the team there. Eventually decided to move on, went into uh, recruiting. Uh, so I started placing people both agency and client side in the creative space. So, you know, web developers, designers, uh, th those kind of professions. And um, it was great. I got to know a lot of people through that job. I ended up essentially placing myself at a company called Fantasy Interactive, which was a front end design and development company. And I went from PR coordinator slash recruiter to the business director and worked on uh, developing new business capabilities, presentations, writing statements of work traveling around the world, splitting my time between Tribeca and Stockholm. And uh, I got to work with some great clients. We got to work with Nintendo, Porsche, Electronic Arts. And uh, eventually I found myself on a beach in Maui with uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, Erin. And I was painting and just enjoying myself and realized that I finally needed to man up and just follow my passion. So on July 2nd of 2009, when I was 28 years old, I left my advertising job, became a full-time artist, and that's what I've been doing ever since. <laughs> okay, um, I just I've been listening to the last five minutes of that with my my jaw open because um, that, that <laughs> okay that I thought I had an eclectic background and career. Oh my goodness, that's extraordinary. How how did you get from? graduating, as I understand it, with a degree in graphic design to working in the legal department, to working to recruiting web developers, the, like that you, you've, you're jumping not just from different skill sets, but entirely different business contexts. And, and I would imagine that people don't just walk into completely different jobs uh, as easily as that sounds, I, I don't understand how how were you able to jump around so much so it, across such vast divides in in the the industries that you were working in. You know, I mean, it's a great question. Essentially, you know, now that I feel like the elder statesman giving advice to people who are younger these days, I like to just say, you know, say yes, just say yes. Try something that is completely outside of your comfort zone because you're going to learn something incredible. You know, working at the Trump Organization, I mean, I went in there essentially like a scruffy looking dude with a, a see-through tuck shirt with paper clips for cufflinks and interviewed and, and my would-be boss looked at me like I was a disaster and just asked me why I wanted to even consider this job. And I said, you know, I want to learn. Um, I'm, I, I have a great work ethic. I'm ready to just roll up my sleeves, get to work. I want to be here. I want to, I want to learn things I had no idea about. So I always say it's a great idea to take a job outside of your comfort zone in a different industry with the caveat being never stay for more than two years. Because once you get over two years, you, you're absolutely good enough for the job and they're going to incentivize you to stay. And once you get to that certain financial point, it's really difficult to walk away, especially to take a backward move in a career that you're passionate about. So, yeah, I mean, I just basically have throughout my life said yes. And I, even though I'm not changing careers in my art career, I've always had that same idea and ideology is that, you know, if someone says, hey, why don't you go and meet my uh, meet a collector in Antwerp and see what it's see what it's all about and see if you guys hit it off. And I'll just say yes. And I go and see what happens. So uh, it's just that's extraordinary. Ha have you ever found yourself at the two year mark and actually going beyond that and then finding it really hard to extricate yourself or, or were you able to, to remain disciplined and always sort of uh, you pull the rip cord before two years elapsed? You know, I, when I was in that life, when I was going through that experience, I didn't have a, a fixed rule, but I realized in retrospect, when I looked at my LinkedIn and it was like this job, one year, nine months, this year, this job, one year, 11 months, this job, uh, this job, one year, 10 months. And it just became, I think for me, I was always living a different life because I found that I was able to. So I was able to work in a legal context and I was able to work as a recruiter and I was able to work in advertising, but it was not, it was not my passion. I was always passionate about finding a challenge, identifying a challenge, try to, trying to solve the challenge. But I realized that I had to be true to myself. And in retrospect, I look back and I'm like, wow, I never stayed at a place more than two years. And, you know, in subsequent conversations that I've had with people, I've, I've talked to them and really what, what becomes difficult is you get to a certain point financially 
to walk away from your job because your lifestyle, your housing, um, everything that you do is accommodated to the income that you have. And, you know, when I left advertising, I was well into the six figures. And my first year as an artist, I think I cleared about 33,000. So that was a significant financial hit. Yeah. So, okay. That's fascinating. So you're, you're sitting on a beach in Maui and you say, right, I'm going to, I'm going to leave all of this, this fascinating and lucrative, or at least stable and a good source of income, uh, checkered career that you have, and you're going to become an artist. What was the, the thinking behind that? Because yes, you want to follow your passion, but you, you must have seen that there would have been a financial penalty you know, that there would have been a huge question mark over where the money's coming from once you take that step. What was the thought process going into that? You know, I, it was just kind of one of those things where it, I, I heard this great story about Brad Pitt once where he woke up one day and he realized like he just kind of like would hang around, just smoke a bunch of weed and then like get these great roles and become these interesting people. And he just decided I'm tired of pretending to be someone interesting and I want to be someone interesting myself. So he got into all these different things, furniture making, architecture, really just tried to develop who he was as a person where obviously, you know, he didn't need to take a break from films because everybody wants to hire Brad Pitt for a picture because he's awesome. And he decided to develop himself further. And I realized I'm like, you know what? I, I, I just, I'm tired of making money for other people. I'm tired of, being someone who I can excel at a job if I work hard at it, but I don't get that same satisfaction that I get if it's something that I create with my own two hands. So I said, you know what, I'm going to do this. And I realized that I couldn't do it part-time. A lot of advice I got was take a part-time job, work 20 hours a week and start building your art career and segue from there. But I always tell people you have to jump off the cliff and go full in because if you don't, it's so easy to step away. And so much of being a professional in the creative field is taking an entire day, wasting it, doing paint that you're going to completely paint over, literally laying on the floor and staring at the ceiling for two hours. This is all part of your job. And if you're working halftime, you don't allocate that time to just beat yourself up a little, which you need to do. So, yeah, so beating yourself up is part of the artistic process. Of course. I mean, sometimes you just got to haul off and whack yourself in the face. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Is that is that from the point of view of keeping yourself disciplined? Yeah, it's it's part discipline. It's part uh, it, it's part uh, sanity. You know, like there was this great story about Michelangelo, and so obviously he did the sculpture David, and so you know he he was uh, you know he had the benefactors, the Medici, and you know so there were a couple of really big benefactors who had come in to see him, and he was sitting on a chair and he's staring at this slab of concrete. And they just kind of looked at him and walked away. And six months later, they went back and he's still sitting in that chair, still staring at the slab. And they were like, dude, what are you doing? Obviously, they didn't say dude at the time, but it, he just looked over and he said, I'm working. And then six months later, boom, it was it was David. So, you know, there's I always think about that story. And when I get stuck in a painting, I'll literally put it against the wall. I'll sit across the room in my studio in a chair, sit there and look and just look and look and look. And it's amazing what you could do if you detach yourself from the process to just really, really look at what you're doing and, and little tiny things like maybe you just got to change the angle on an eyebrow or like, oh, just the tone of this neon tube and I can really bring this painting to the next level. Without that time, if you don't have that time, you're never going to get to the next phase of your career. Absolutely. So I, I, I'm fascinated by a quote of yours that I came across online, which was, when I became a full-time painter in 2009, I vowed to be entrepreneurial and treat my art career like a business. And I'm, I'm curious to know what that was. How did you go about thinking about it as a business from the very beginning? Well, I mean, you know, I realized that with this experience that I had in, in branding and marketing um, and selling, uh, that everything is a brand. And if you want to be someone successful, you have to build a brand because what it comes down to is when someone walks in a room and sees Marilyn Monroe on the wall, you know, in bright colors, they don't see Marilyn Monroe or a painting. They're like, that's a Warhol. Mm. You know, when you walk in, that's a Basquiat, that's a, you know, that's a whoever. So I realized I had to create something where someone saw it and said, that's a Bourbet. So, you know, when we were working with electronic arts in our advertising agency, they would build a product, say NHL 2018. So they have a game. Mm -hmm. 
So great. So, but then they have to, they have to brand the game and they got to get a player on the cover. So they do a voting process, creates interest. Then they do a beautiful cover design. And then uh, for them, it's really challenging to get people to buy through their website. So then they have to build an experience around it. So they put that game online. Then they have interviews with the people who develop the game. They have interviews with the athletes, behind the scenes takes, detailed information, specs, so much that when you're on the site, you just say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to buy it here. So when I decided to become an artist, I was like, okay, I need to have a logo. I need to have an identity. I need to have a website and a social media presence that's consistent. Um, when I create a painting, I treat it like EA treats a video game. And I do a photo of the painting, but then I do about 10 to 15 interstitial photos of the process and also create a time-lapse video of the experience. Because when someone sees a painting, they're like, great, I love that painting, but $15,000, why am I going to spend that on this painting? And then they're able to walk through the process, understand you know, what I created, how I created it, um, the meaning behind certain elements of the painting. I mean, that's what draws people in. People don't buy paintings. They buy stories and they buy a piece of an artist. Uh, I'm curious to know about the choice of the name Bourbet. Why reduce it to one, one word as opposed to Jason Bourbet? You are just Bourbet. Great. It's a great question. So it was kind of a, um, a contemporary solution to a timeless problem. So first off, my whole life, despite the fact that the, the precedent of Manet, Monet, and Corbet all exist, nobody knows how to pronounce my name. So it would be Borbit, Brobit, horribly so Bobbit at the wrong time in my life in sixth, sixth grade. So, you know, essentially, I struggled with the fact that people struggle with my name. But what happened was in college, I had a fifth year because I had some athletic eligibility and I had some classes left over that I needed to fulfill. So I spoke with a professor and he was my design professor. And I said, you know, if I build a website, do you think I can get this locked in? And, and he's like, absolutely. So I went to buy borbet.com and it was a German company that made rims and hubcaps for uh, Volkswagen. So I decided to look for borbay, which was available. And then I started to feel connected to this name. And it was a way to kind of phonetically spell how my name is pronounced, but it just felt like me. And I don't know, there was something about it that I loved. And I was doing a painting, and this is kind of pre-professional in 2003. And I signed a portrait, B-O-R-B-E-T, and reflected B-O-R-B-A-Y. And then I decided that's going to be my art name. So from there forward, I decided to go Bourbet. And I almost went as far as legalizing it to just change my name to Bourbet. But this was around when I got married and my wife was taking my last name. And she says, if I change my name and you change your name after I change my name, we're going to have problems. So <laughs> I decided to keep my separability so I can be Jason T. Borbet and DBA Borbet and have have that be a little bit different. And But it's one of those things where, you know, I mean, I'm not calling myself a prince or a Madonna, but I most certainly aspire to be. That's great. Yes, because exactly. It, it hints at that. The... The, well, the, the artist formerly known as Jason Borbet is now Borbet. <laughs> Do you feel that that helps with promoting your work? Is it a sort of a, a distillation of your brand? Is, is it as conscious as that? Do you feel like it, it benefits you to have that one name as opposed to being Jason T. Borbet or Jason Borbet? Yes, I absolutely do. And if anything else, the cool part about it is that it always generates a conversation. Uh -huh. And, you know, for me, someone who has a kind of wide background in sales and a variety of different industries and just who I consider myself a people person, you know, once I could get a conversation going, that's a huge advantage for me. And I love to get to know people and just one of those kind of fun stories, but also what it demonstrates just by telling the story is that it's an attention to detail that I take very seriously. And, you know, and that comes back to the branding and every single aspect of your brand from how you package something that you're going to ship to someone to the handwritten cards that you send to the gifts that you send to a collector after they buy a painting, this all makes a significant impact. So, you know, when someone's like, Oh, so your name is Borbet. And then I tell the story and then it's like, we're already connected. Mm, fantastic. So again, you're pulling people into a narrative. Yes. And your logo, what was the thinking behind having that, for example, as opposed to using your signature as your logo? Because in a way, an artist's signature does become a signifier of them, and it can become a de facto logo. Why, why did you choose something separate from that? You know, I mean, that's a great question. And in fact, when I started, my signature was my logo. And, um, you know, I just felt that 
my brand is such a reflection of who I am that I felt that my logo should be me. And so the, so I based that I, it's a vector graphic that I created based on a photograph. And so the photograph was something that I took in a reflection in a hotel in Milan. And it was during the trip when I went to go deliver the first two paintings that I sold professionally in person. And so it was this really significant moment in my career so I felt like I wanted to freeze that forever and create something that I felt would be timeless that I don't get bored of. And I mean, I started using this logo and I want to say maybe 2010 and it's eight years later and I still feel good about it and it feels fresh. Um, you know, and like anything else, look, you know, I do square format portraits. I did those before Instagram, but certainly I took that from Warhol. You know, when you think of square portrait, I think of Warhol. You know, when you think of a black and white logo with a face, certainly you got to think of Shepard Fairey and his Obey. And, you know, so I'm not in any way abashed about saying that, you know, I absolutely used influence from these other artists because I did. And anyone who says they don't is is really just lying through their teeth. I mean, these guys who came before us, they're, they, we, they gave us a journey. They gave us a path to follow it and, and mold to our own path. So, yeah, that was that was it. And I, I really felt that the face was was more me than a signature. Yes, it's just another element that extends the brand and extends the narrative as well, which is fascinating. And it leads us right back to uh, selling a painting, which is <laughs> which is fantastic. Then, you know, if you're telling that to a, a potential buyer, then you're 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 already moving back into talking about sales and and prices. And it, it elevates you in the mind of a buyer. Well, certainly, well, it elevates you in my mind, thinking, wow, geez, this guy's you know, flown off to Milan to hand deliver a, a painting. Like, that, that just sounds, <laughs> that sounds so, so jet set and successful as an artist, yes. which, which is really exciting as well. So it, it's an interesting, almost an interesting way of positioning yourself in the mind of, of your audience. I'm curious to know when, you, like you said, when you first started out, when you, once you you chose to commit to being an artist and you found your, you suddenly had a huge drop in income from six figures to about 30 K. How did you manage to turn that around? What was there a business plan? Did, was there a long-term vision or was it just a uh, kind of like, I'm doing this and I'm going to f figure it out as I go along? Well, I mean, great question. You know, when I started, I knew that there was going to be a pay drop. Fortunately, I, I was blessed with the ability of fiscal responsibility. So when I left my advertising job, I had quite a good saving. So I knew I didn't have to panic. Panic is the greatest detriment to an artist in their career because it makes you make terrible, terrible decisions. And so, you know, when I started out, I just started to, uh, I called myself a location artist and I would set up my plain air easel all around New York and then eventually, you know, Las Vegas, Chicago, Milan, China, wherever. And, you know, this gave me the opportunity to create in public and to dialogue with people while I'm creating. So that helped my business. It just helped me. I was out there and then people would take notice and I started getting press. Um, and then in terms of the business model, I realized that, you know, you can only build your market so it's sustainable with your collector base. So if I'm selling paintings, you know, when I first sold, the first painting I ever sold was a Guggenheim painting, a 30 by 30 in 2009, and it was 2,400. So I got that number. I didn't pull it out of anywhere. I sent the photo of the painting to my friend who worked at a really reputable gallery and said, this is the size, this is the media. What do you think I should sell it for? He said, I would try for 2,400. That seems congruent with the market for other artists doing similar work. Um, if you had to negotiate no lower than 1500 and once you make your first sale, that's you, you know, that's how you establish your market. So I established my market there. And if someone came along and wanted to buy another painting and offered me $15,000 for a painting that was listed at 2400, I would tell them, no, the painting is 2400. Cause if I take 15,000, I can no longer sell paintings of that style and size for less than 15,000. And I would have decimated my market. So I realized it was going to be a very slow, very gradual growing period. So I created the protocol, which was paint in public, do a lot of process updates, both on social media and on my website. As soon as I finish a painting or a series, I would send it out to anyone in the media that I thought would connect with the work. Um, I would also create thematic bodies of work. So I had three portrait series, which I did uh, the Kings of Hip Hop. I did mm -hmm. kick-ass actors and kick-ass roles and the anti-heroes. And those thematic series really made me, it helped me create something that you could wrap your hands around. So it's very easy to pitch to the media. It's very easy to pitch to people who are just 
looking at the series and then they want to be part of it. It's like this team of people who are all part of kick-ass actors, all part of, all part of the anti-heroes. And it's like these people from around the world that are connected through this series of work. Um, and, and that's huge. And every year you got to increase your prices. I increase my prices every year on January 1st. And again, in a sustainable fashion, it's the first Guggenheim I did in the series, 2,400, I'm doing one every year for 20 years. I'm coming up on year number 10. Year number nine is still available and it's listed at 15,000. So that's been my gradual climb over the past eight years. So I know where the market is going and I grow in a way that I'm not alienating old collectors, but can attract new collectors in different demographics. Okay. There's loads in there that I, I would love to to explore. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay. So when you created these series, were they okay i'm gonna backtrack a real question that i have and, and that i know a lot of people that i've been speaking to a lot of creatives have is a concern that if they start thinking too much about their creative practice as a business that it's going to detract from their ability to create or the freedom to create as they wish so uh with that in mind i'm curious to know whether the series that you created were they created because that was something that you wanted to explore? Was it something that you created because you felt that you could create a narrative and you could sell them? Or was it finding a compromise between the two? Like maybe you had other ideas for series that you felt weren't as marketable so that you chose not to explore those, whereas these were more marketable and of interest, so you committed to these. You know, I, I think of it as a chicken and egg scenario. Whatever came first is irrelevant. You know, I think for anyone who creative you really can hone in on the creativity within certain confines and parameters so for example i think you know my kings of hip-hop series i love i love hip-hop i grew up with hip-hop i was like this is what i want to do so the fact that i wanted to paint hip-hop portraits no brainer i knew what style i wanted to do it was a collage painting style i'd been developing so i had the idea i had the concept i had the style of mine so i thought why not set some parameters to make it more interesting so I said to myself, I'm going to paint seven hip hop artists that were entrepreneurial, involved in social media and releasing an album within one year. So for me, there was no creativity lost by setting those parameters. It just, pro it provided me with a challenge that I was excited about. And so I did that series. I finished the seventh painting in the series, which was Lil Wayne. And literally I, I, I named the series Kings of Hip Hop with a hashtag, right? Kings of Hip Hop. And I was like, great. So the next day I look on Twitter and I see that someone from Forbes had released in uh, a list called the Cash Kings of Hip Hop. So I click on the link and I look at these and I look at the list through the criteria of three pieces of criteria. I had picked one, two, three, four, and three guys tied for sixth. So it was ridiculous how on point that was by that three pieces of criteria so much so that I said, and I know I'm getting ahead. I, you're probably going to ask this later, but I feel like it all goes in good co continuity. So I called up uh, Forbes General Line and I just said, can I have Zach O'Malley Greenberg, please? So they put me through to his desk and I said, Mr. Greenberg, uh, I, I just read your article, The Cash Kings of Hip Hop. I just did this painting series. Can I have five minutes of your time? And from there, I mean, that was just a huge point in my career and that was facilitated by creating these confines within a creative space. So clearly there, there is something to be said for it being very contemporary content that you're exploring because that's more likely to, to be, and, and this is, I don't you know, feel like I'm anyway trying to unpick what happened, but I, I, can, I can see how your choice of contemporary subject matter would have a greater likelihood to correlate with other things that are happening in the media and lead to other to, to new opportunities and collaborations. I'm curious to know then how you feel that would work for someone who's creating work that isn't connected to contemporary culture. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I think that this applies to anybody and it just works out that I, I happen to be a pop culture fanatic and I love movies. I love music. I love writers. I love all these things. And it's, so for me, there's a never ending source of inspiration and, and passion that I can 
dedicate a half a year or a year to creating a, a really thematic work, a body of work and, and a series that also happens to be easy to market. Um, but let's say, for example, you're an abstract painter. That's totally, totally fine. So if you look at a lot of great painters throughout time, you have Picasso, uh, who went through a blue period, a rose period, you know, this abstract period where he was influenced by African masks that he saw in museums and tried to appropriate that in his own visual language. So if you're an abstract painter, you, you're going to paint what you feel. You're going to paint your emotions. But why not then set a parameter of say, I'm going to do seven of these paintings or 10 of these paintings, and they're all going to be four by four feet, and they're all going to use a certain palette, or they're all going to be inspired by a certain emotion. So you could call a series, you know, dystopia, and it could be all abstract and it could be all in different colors, but the continuity could be it was created in the same, you know, time period in an artist's career, all in the same size canvas, and that's it. You know, it doesn't have to be this, you know, mine was very deeply thought out, connected and easy to market because we're talking hip hop, we're talking money, but it doesn't have to be that way. It could be anything. If you happen to love wildlife, instead of painting, you know, like an aardvark today and, a, and an antelope tomorrow and a bear the next day, you know, you could paint eight bears, 10 bears, or, you know, you could do 10 different animals, but all in the same size canvas in the same background or have continuity through color. And then just wrap that series into a name. It's just people need something to grab a hold of. And they need to they need to understand what they're looking at and what they're buying. And if something is part of a series that marks a certain part of an artist's career, no matter how obtuse the series connection, a connection is important. Yeah, it, it sounds like fundamentally, it's sort of across the board, all of the things we've been talking about is giving your audience context either as you as an artist or the, the what the the work is about or what's what the series is about you're giving them more information to give to understand what they're looking at uh, yes exactly. which is great that's a really really fantastic sort of fundamental way of looking at it right and if I, and if I may I think it's also important to note that you know what I what I have adopted over the course of my career is there's two primary facets of what I do. So I do spec series, which is something like the Kings of Hip Hop or, you know, my neon series, which is what I'm doing for myself. This is what I'm inspired to do. This is what I'm passionate about doing. This is what I'm doing right now. But then what I also do is I do commissions and commissions for me and for many artists that I know are the lifeblood of your business. And this is when someone comes in and says, I love this piece you did. I would love to do that exact style with this palette of this subject. And What's amazing about a commission is, you know, the way I architect it is you sign the contract up front, 50% payment before you start, 50% upon approval prior to shipping. So if you're able to line up one commission per month and you know you're getting 50% payment and then the other 50% is coming upon completion, you know, one, two, three months, weeks, whatever, after when you start the painting, you're able to predict your income and you're able to understand where you are financially, which gives you a lot of creativity and freedom to create those spec series. Mm. Um, in the middle of that, you have a whole different other line of work where, you know, you may have a licensing deal. You know, I'm working with um, this new EDM band called Sauce and I'm providing covers for them. And in exchange, I'm getting a percentage of their catalog. So you have these licensing deals where, you know, I have a painting that's on uh, a vodka label, for example, or, you know, I was very close to doing a really large scale engagement with uh, an athletic brand. So you do those, that's your tertiary source of income. So the more of those you get where you get the kind of passive income and the more commissions you get where you get the fixated income, the more creativity you have. So in creating this body of work, I'm not saying leave your job paint full time or create full time and do just this body of work that you're not passionate about that, but you know, you might be able to sell. It's all about compartmentalizing your time and finding the time for those passion projects in lieu of the, in lieu of the commissions. And it's also the onus is on the artist when you're commissioned to do a piece, you don't want to create a monster. You want to create something that's going to be beautiful. So you have to control the process. And that's where, you know, the advice to take any other job. If you spend any time in advertising, you understand the maxim that if you give the client three concepts, they'll pick the worst concept and then make it three times worse through their feedback. You have to control that creative process. So there's, there's, it's not a point to point relationship with that series. I just think if you have a series that's thematic, it's going to be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll start with commissions. 
how did you go? How did you get your first commission? And are, are there particular uh, strategies that you use to encourage or solicit commissions? Absolutely. So the first commission I got, uh, and this is this sounds a little bourgeois, but we were we were I used to live in a luxury building on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and we had a hot tub on the roof. And so I was sitting in the hot tub, and this gentleman Ron, who lived in the penthouse, was sitting there talking to me, and I told him about you know, I've been doing more painting and I'm getting excited about it. And he's like, do you ever do commissions? I'm like, sure. I'd never done a commission before, but I said, of course. And so he wanted a uh, painting of the Hawaii coastline where he had gotten married to his wife. And so I got that process going, created a contract. And that was how I got my first commission, which was basically just a by chance conversation. And then over the years, it's something that I've really carefully refined and developed. So now I have on my website, there's a page that is, you know, borbay.com slash commissions. And so you go to that page and you can read about the process from start to finish. Uh, very basic minutia from, you know, we get a conversation going, you identify that you wish to have a commission painting and then all the steps that we go through from start to finish. And, you know, what I try to do is, you know, in my newsletter, I keep people updated on my commission step, uh, commission availability. So one month it might say wait list three months, you know, a couple months later it'd say I'm available to take a commission on the 15th of the next month. Or I might say I have the availability for one more commission this year. Um, and it's great because it keeps people apprised of where you are and what your availability is, but it also kind of incentivizes them to get on top of it and get it going. You know, the commission process is something you have to learn. You have to break yourself in as an artist to understand the commission process because there's so much dialogue and there's feedback and for an artist that can be really difficult, but I've gotten it to a point now where I feel like I'm really able to control the process to ensure that what we create is what we set out to create and that it's going to be better than expected. Okay. So, oh, it just opens up more questions because the, it, it is that thing. Cause there, I think there's also a fear about once you open up that question of someone else's taste and having to, bear that in mind as you're creating work without losing sight of your own voice or your own taste and expression. Do you have any advice on how to maintain that? You know, I, honestly, when you start doing commissions, it's scary. It is a scary process. You know, the, the, the loss of control is, is very, very frightening to artists, but I think that, you know, what you find is the onus is on you to create something every time that is going to be up to your standard. And that means sometimes you have to go against the will of someone commissioning a painting. And, you know, I've been doing commissions since I started painting, even before full-time art in 2008. So I, I've been doing it for 10 years. You know, I would say on average, I receive about 10 commissions to 15 commissions a year, depending on the year. And I've literally had one rejected and it was essentially because the, I, I went through the process and they approved of everything along the way and then realized that they shouldn't have approved some of the elements. So we had to walk away from it. But I mean, in terms of success rate, I mean, it's very high and, you know, and we were happy to figure something out and work something out for that. But, you know, again, like if you're doing a commission, you get 50% down and you're controlling the process. If they reject the commission, they should also understand that they're forfeiting that 50%. If they want another painting, they're going to have to pay for it. So it's tricky. It doesn't happen that often if you're, if you're, if you have the process dialed, but it happens. And have you ever been approached to do a commission and said no? You know, I have, um, there have been people where I've gotten on a call with them and we discussed the, you know, the concept and what they wanted to create. And I just literally, it just, they wanted a different artist and, you know, maybe it was because they liked me or it was just, they had an idea. They thought my work was what they wanted. And in those cases, I just gladly refer them to other artists and, you know, some of the best deals you ever make are the deals you walk away from. I knew it wasn't going to work out. I knew what we created wasn't what they were going to look for. Then I introduced them to an artist who I knew would be perfect and it was great. And that was goodwill for the other artists. So sometimes like you have to walk away. I had someone offer me $5,000 for a painting, which at the time was listed at 7,500. And I just said, listen, you know, I, I can't come down from that because someone else has bought a painting in this series for 7,500. And they said, well, you know, they were playing hardball. They're like, well, you know, that's great if you built your own market and, you know, but we can't pay more than 5,000. So I said, thank you. I appreciate the offer, but I have to decline. You know, six years later, that same painting sold for 14,000. So, 
you know, I stuck to my guns. It's always hard to walk away from money, but if you don't respect your market, then you're going to decimate your market. I've been reading the articles that you've written on Forbes and they've just been completely blowing my mind because it's a whole different way. I, I should have front loaded this from the very beginning that this is all completely new to me. So one of the things that I found fascinating is, is how you think about your market and the money. And one of the articles that you wrote mentioned something very similar to what you're saying is that when you have a series of work and you sell one painting at one price, you can't sell the rest at less than that price because then the collector or the buyer of the original painting or paintings is going to feel that they've paid over the odds for that piece of work. And then they lose confidence in you as an artist or the market, which is fascinating to me because that, that's just an entirely different way of thinking that, that you have to set a standard or a benchmark and then you have to maintain that. And I can see how that can become at times difficult, but in the long view has to be something that you, you maintain. Exactly. And, you know, I always like to come up with the hypothetical situation of, let's say you did a, a, a five painting series and you had a collector come to your studio. They wanted to buy two paintings in the series. The paintings were listed at 10000 a piece. So they paid 20000 for two paintings. And, you know, maybe you gave it to them for eighteen five because they bought two at once, right? Totally legit. No problem there. So they bought two paintings for eighteen five. So fast forward three months, same series that are all listed at 10000 You have someone come in, rent is due, you have no money, literally no money. So they're like, I want to buy this painting, but I can't give you more than 4000 And you're like, man, that'll pay rent for a couple months. So you take the deal. And so then I like to fast forward another six months and imagine those two people are in Miami and they get in an elevator together. They strike a conversation somehow identify that they both collect your work and so they get to talking and as collectors might do they'll be like oh do you mind uh what series did you collect oh i collected this series oh me too do you mind me asking what you paid they're like no 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 it's cool like you know they're they're really killing it i paid uh 18.5 for two of the paintings and then the other guy says whoa i paid four for one of the paintings in that series so you've you've cratered your market and collapsed it by more than 50 percent of the value because you made a decision based on panic and you've lost two collectors because they're never going to believe in your market. They're never going to believe in you. And they're never going to trust you again. So you have to realize that you have to you have to leave business on the table no matter how, how hard it is. No matter how much you need that money, you cannot devalue your market, which is another reason that you must grow in a sustainable way. And you should never, ever, ever ask someone, oh, what would you pay for this? Because if someone says, oh, man, you know, I've had collectors where I sold the painting for like 8000 they're like, man, I would have paid 25000 for that. And I'm like, that's great because I aspire to get to 25000 I aspire to get beyond 25000 But if I jump to 25000 now, I don't have access to that kind of market. And I will crater my market and destroy my brand. And it happens to artists all the time. By overreaching or trying to, to grow too fast. That and being opportunistic. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of artists out there who just want to put bandanas over their face and do like the same graffiti that like 50 other artists do and have probably have trust funds and they hang out and they take photos of themselves on Instagram in a Lamborghini with their bandanas on and talking about baller lifestyle and they buy 50,000 followers and whatever. And that's cool. That's great. Like there are people who just want to be, you know, celebrities and they just want to be known and they want to look like ballers and that's totally cool. But I mean, when it comes down to it, if you want to just build a sustainable business, you have to be a sober business person, which is a very strange bedfellow for an artist who tends to be more creative, a little kind of fly by the seat of their pants. And, you know, for me, it came down to lifestyle. When I became a full-time artist, I, at the time, only had a girlfriend. Now I have a wife and three children under five. I said, I'm going to be a nine to fiver. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do drugs when I'm working. I'm not going to work on the weekends if I can help it. I got to treat this like a business because if I don't, it'll get out of control. And the last thing in the world you want to do is become an artist who creates only their best work when they're like tuned up at like two in the morning because it's not sustainable. That lifestyle is going to kill you. And it's just, it's just not the way you want to do it. Some people do it and kudos to them and I love them for it. For me, sober businessman, only way to do it. And how did you figure all this out? How, how much of this is built on your experience in the more corporate world? And how much of this have you had to, to figure out and learn on your own as you came along? And, and the reason I'm asking is, 
a lot of people listening don't have your skill set and your your financial nous. They they don't have this bigger picture view of of how all these pieces fit together of of marketing and collectors and thinking about their work as a business. So I'm curious to know what it is that how you've gotten to this point. You know, it's absolutely goes back to my, you know, previous work experience and you know, and believe me like what I'm a I'm a, I'm a guy who likes to party, you know. I like I like my beers, I like my scotch, I like my tequila, I like to just do what I want to do, but it all comes down to being able to be responsible for what you need to do. So when you're working at a job, yeah, like look, I worked in some heavy heavy jobs. When you're in advertising, part of your job, especially as a business guy, is to be out schmoozing. So, you know, whatever, if I'm going to have to stay out till six in the morning with a client, that's fine. I'm just going to stop drinking at two, make sure I'm hydrated. So even if I only get two hours of sleep, I could show up and get my job done. So, you know, that real life experience really fuels you for what you need to do. So if I know that I need to work on a mural, a commission, finish a, a spec painting and prepare for a show and then prepare for a charity event, which is essentially what I've been doing over the last two weeks. I know, like, no matter what, like, at the end of the day, when I want to unwind with a cocktail, it's going to be one cocktail. It's going to be six cocktails. I'm not going to go, you know, golf all day as much as I would love to when I have a really tight timeline for these big major projects. So, you know, it's something, it's it's learned behavior. It's like turning yourself from a night person to a morning person. And you, it, it's not easy to do, but in the long run, it's it's what you need to do. Absolutely. There, there's another side to this, though, that I'm, I'm still curious to know, because there, there are a lot of artists who do put the hours in and who don't have financial success. We can define financial success any number of ways, but um, just as a, as a simple measure, a lot of artists who put the hours in, but who still struggle to make ends meet uh, or have to then take on supplementary jobs in order to supplement their income. Is there something that's unique to you that allows you to make this your complete career? Is it luck? Is it talent with the work that you create? Or are there skills that you've learned that you think have helped you position yourself where you are now? So yeah, that's, I mean, that's, it's so complex. And it's a really great question. I mean, what I like to do is I think about myself as like, a, like if you're a baseball fan, Matsui, right? Long, 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 long career. And he is not the best hitter. He's not the best fielder. Uh, he's not the fastest guy out there. But man, is he really good at everything. He is just consistent. He stays healthy. He's a really good fielder. He's got really good at, at the plate. And he's built this decade-plus-long career by being able to do all these other things, not the best in any one area, but really well across the board. So for me, look, I'm a realist, okay? There, I... I, I just got back from 11 days in Europe and I, I saw so many artists out there. They just blew my mind. You know, I am not ever going to be the best artist ever. I understand that. I appreciate that. But when it comes down to it, I'm going to still be standing decade after decade after decade because I do have the fortunate background where I do know business. I know contracts. I know how to build a market. I know negotiations. I know people and I know self-promotion. One of the things that people have to realize is that you could be the most talented artist in the world, but you have to also understand your weakness. If your weakness is business, talking money, interacting with clients, that's fine. All you need to do is find a champion that is going to help take you to the next level of your career. I mean, people don't know Andy Warhol, guy was a hustler. When he got into New York City, he was walking with holes in his shoes, taking his drawing portfolio to Condé Nast, taking it to Vogue, taking these different magazines getting published as an illustrator, hustling, hustling, hustling. When he had his breakthrough, he started to find people who wanted to represent him. And so they started pounding the pavement for him and they started building this market for him. And he was able to then create that persona where he was more aloof, you know, where he was very quiet, kind of awkward. But in the, you know, in the, in the heart of Andy Warhol was a hustler who wanted to be more aloof and wanted to be more of a kind of unusual brand. And through his connections of evangelists, he was able to do that. Francis Bacon, same thing. You know, he's known as this tortured alcoholic gambling artist who, you know, would just go to Monaco, stay up all night, get drunk and, you know, with his litany of lovers and create a series of work in two hours that would end up being these like legendary paintings. Truth was, he was one of the 50 people to know in London as an interior designer before he was this world-famous tortured artist. 
And there was a business background, but again, he was able to find that help through galleries and through evangelists that allowed him to fortify the brand he wanted to be. But at the base of him, he understood the business. So if you're someone who is a, is an amazing artist and you're not making it, you need somebody. The gallery system right now is in a really bad place. You're seeing, you know, these, it, it's kind of like it mirrors the economic structure of what's happening in the world where the top 1% of the world owns, say, 60 or 70% of the global wealth. And then there's just this unbelievable drop off and essentially eliminating the middle class. So too, in the arts, you see the, the middle class of artists are gone. You know, you have people who are just emerging in that like one to 8,000 range that'll do well. But as soon as they get to that eight to 20, there's a real famine and it's a real difficult area to develop because the overhead for a gallery is so high that developing an artist from eight to 20 to 25 to 50 is so, it, you can't even do it. It's not a fiscally responsible decision. So artists are left up to themselves. So the best thing you could do is find someone who is going to manage and evangelize your work, give them 20%, you know, give them 30%, don't give them 50%, make it worth their while. And if they could go around and sell your work, boom, you're in the money. Eventually, if you become big enough, you'll be, you'll be, some big gallery is going to come after you. And even if you go through the galleries, you'll start at your neighborhood gallery. You start up a couple of good shows, a bigger gallery will get you. It's kind of like that, you know. The guppy gets swallowed up by the fish. The fish gets swallowed up by the shark. The shark gets caught by the man. You know, it eventually it kind of spirals and snowballs, whether you're self-represented or with a gallery or with someone who is a business manager uh, that was just going to be out there putting your name out there and selling your work. But, you know, you have to know you're, if you're an amazing artist, but you cannot do business, then get someone who could do it for you. You don't have to do everything. I just have this background, so I do it. But it's it's exhausting and believe me, I would love to be able to be more kind of like aloof and weird than I already am if I had someone selling my work, but I don't. So I lionize the artist, businessman within. I think that's a fantastic sort of call to arms for, for anyone listening yeah, is to, to either champion yourself or find someone who can champion you. And that that's interesting because I... Uh, in, in the first series of the podcast, I interviewed a, a potter, Keith Brimmer Jones. He's he's uh, quite well known over here in the UK. And a lot of his success began, as I understand it, when he found a business partner who has no interest in pottery or ceramics or any sort of creative expression, but felt that he could make a business with Keith's work. And that partnership has led to a whole host of new opportunities for him. And it's allowed him to, to really expand the reach of what he does. And his, his personal brand has extended significantly as a result. And he, he says the exact same thing. You have to understand what your weaknesses are. And uh, as he puts it, not, not feel like you have to make up for all those weaknesses yourself. You can find people who have those, what your weaknesses are, are their strengths and partner with them. And that can lead you to other places. So I think that's, a, that's a, a very exciting and compelling note. And I think a great place to wrap up. Oh, no, you know, absolutely. And it's, it's one of those things where I think you just, you really need to know who you are. And, and that's the most important thing. So no, I, I feel great about it. I think we covered some awesome stuff. And it, it's been great to be here with you. Well, I know we've covered a huge amount of, of material in, in the last hour and a lot of very practical things within that. But if you could leave listeners with one action step or a practical challenge that they could apply to their own practice to help them move forward, what, what would that be? Absolutely. I would say that I would challenge you to conceptualize a series of work, devise a marketing strategy and an outreach strategy for this body of work before you create it then execute. And it doesn't matter what it is. If you decide you want to do paintings of trout, great. Figure the parameters of the size, the media, the color palette, then go and say, okay, I'm going to reach out to these, you know, Field and Stream, seven other different outdoor magazines. I'm going to tag these Instagram accounts. I'm going to tag these Facebook accounts. And really, it's basically like building a business plan for a body of work before you create it, then create, then execute, see where you are, and see if that doesn't influence your creativity going forward. That's brilliant. I love the idea of doing that all at the very beginning before you actually start the work, because it, it may actually 
inform the work and not in a negative way. And, uh, and it goes back to that thing of finding a balance as you would with someone who's going to commission some of your work is staying true to what you're doing, but also having this other, this other potential constraint. And as we all know that so much creativity comes from within constraints. So that sounds like a really exciting way of going about it. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a very exciting challenge to put out. You're welcome. And, and the last question is, wh where, where can people find you online? That is very easy. So my website is borbay.com, B-O-R-B-A-Y.com. Uh, then also anywhere online. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, just B-O-R-B-A-Y. And that's it. And I'm pretty easy to contact um, whenever anyone sends me an email or a note on any one of those platforms. May take a minute, but I will absolutely get back to you. And I'd love to be in touch with people. So please feel free to say hello. That's awesome. Brilliant. Well, Jason, thank you so much for your time. It's been brilliant chatting to you. And I, I just can't thank you enough. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you very much for having me. I look forward to sharing this with everybody. there. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of The Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about Jason, you can visit The Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life, where you'll find more about his work and links to his fantastic articles on Forbes. And if you'd like to have a go at Jason's challenge of creating a series with an audience in mind, you can find a written version on the Creative Challenges page. Just head on over to the website and check it out. Also, while you're there, be sure to check out the resources page, where I've compiled links to all the materials and services referenced by my guests, including books they've written on creativity and business, online courses, Facebook groups, and some of my top recommendations for learning more about selling and sharing your work. And if you've enjoyed this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, it would be fantastic if you would subscribe to the show, share it with a friend, or even leave a review on iTunes. And I'd also love to hear from you about what you found to be exciting, inspiring, or even challenging about these conversations. You can contact me directly via the website at thepracticalcreative.life. Until next time. Mm -hmm.